Welcome to the Upshot, Oldie World Disc Golf's podcast about the latest in the disc golf world. I'm the editor, Charlie Eisenhood. Joining me is Josh Mansfield on this Wednesday, September 11th. Yes, Josh, I know. I'm wearing sunglasses inside, and it is nighttime here in Australia, where I am still spending some time. I come back on Friday. Uh, I'm basically on vacation right now. So the fact that I'm even here <laughs> means that I get to wear sunglasses inside. That Fair. I, I'm presuming there's another reason that you're in sunglasses <laughs> inside. <laughs> I just want to look cool on the pod, Josh. <laughs> uh, yes, I am adhering as closely as possible to my jet lag app guidelines. Oh. So I I wore sunglasses on a morning episode of Deep Look, my ultimate podcast, uh, a couple weeks ago before I flew out to Australia. And now... I am currently in a, I'm supposed to be asleep already, but uh, with time zone stuff, Josh has to get up early. I have to stay up late. It is what it is, um, but I am not supposed to be getting light, so I am doing all that I can to minimize light. Got it. Okay. That makes the, sense. The app for everyone's edification is Time Shifter, and I highly recommend it if you're going to be traveling overseas more than six hours out of your time zone. Okay. Australia's jet, jet 14 lag. hours. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, jet, jet lag is jet lag overseas is no joke. It It is brutal, and it can ruin trips. So It's it's put me down in the past. Yeah. it's it's I, So I'm, I'm pretty strict about following this app as much as I can, even when it means that you have to, like, wake up in the plane in the middle of the night and, like, watch movies for six hours. It's not fun, but it, it makes I, a difference, I think. Good. That's cool. Anyway. That's really cool. Now to get to the main part of the show, Josh and Charlie review the presidential debate from Tuesday night. No. Did you watch that on vacation? No. No. Oh. <laughs> no absolutely not. Uh, today, today I went to the rainforest. Wow. Uh, saw crocodiles in the river. Uh, yesterday, I was at the Great Barrier Reef. It's a very nice time here. That sounds awesome. I sounds like I need to make my way to Australia. I I highly recommend it. Don't okay. you feel like outdoors and wildlife? They yeah. got a lot of that. Yeah. So uh, D Glow happened, and uh, we got you know the players of the moment, perhaps taking down the wins. Josh double whammy picked them both. Josh is the new oracle for now. For now. Oh. Boy, I need I need it if I'm going to catch you on the picks. <laughs> I think I'm like 27 points behind you or something. Uh, but Gannon Burr, Holland Hanley getting the win. And I will just fully admit to you right now, I have been on vacation. And before that, I was working like 14-hour days. I have not mm -hmm. watched a ton of D-Glow. But I did catch most of the end of the MPO final round, Josh. And... Um, Got the highlights of Holland closing it out. And, you know, that was, it was kind of weird because the FPO final round looked like it was going to be really exciting. Mm -hmm. And MPO looked like it was going to be a snoozer. And then it ended up being a little dip, like almost flip flopped. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ho Holland comes out getting three birdies through six. A and at that point, she's got, you know, five strokes on Haley. And Kristen comes out and opens with the double bogeys uh, early. And, uh, you know, FPO felt like it was done. Uh, you were a third of the way through the round. And and because it's Holland, you all you had question marks. You had to wonder. And I had to keep it on. But, it, yeah, she ended up closing it out in fashion and, and really kind of did what Holland should be doing when she's in this situation in tournaments. But she has a three-stroke lead. There's no reason that... An okay front nine isn't enough for her to just put away tournaments. And it's just a question of does she have the mental fortitude to do that? Is she able to get out of her own head and, and really play good golf? And she did that this week. She did exactly what I think a lot of us expected her to do at Worlds and have expected her to do, uh, you know, count, countless times. And, and to be frank, she should be in a position right now where she, you know, she's got three wins, which it's already a good season. She should have more. And 
this weekend shows us why Holland has has those three wins and why like she has the capacity to have and should really honestly have more than those. Meanwhile, Gannon plays the most lackluster round. I mean, he's just leaving the door. I don't want to say wide open because he was had a big enough lead that it couldn't ever call it wide open, but he left it open. Mm -hmm. And when Ricky birdied on 16, you're like, okay, like this could happen. We could, this is going to get exciting. And then Gannon with a beautiful drive on 17 and Ricky throws it into the shrubs. And then, you know, Gannon closed out when it mattered the most and Ricky didn't. And it just feels familiar, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like we, it was different because the level of play was so much higher at the European Open. But we we watched a similar story play out at the end of the European Open with Ricky almost getting there and then not quite getting there. And it happens again. And, you know, despite Isaac Robinson winning Worlds, I think there's a pretty good argument to make that Gannon and Ricky are like the best players on earth right now. Um, and Gannon just seems to be able to clutch up right now in a way that Ricky hasn't been able to. Well, it's, it's two things. It's, it, it's the clutch factor, but, but again, it's, it's not necessary. Like it, it's Gannon has also just been excellent when there's been more around and Ricky, Ricky is not, um, in fact, it's it's quite the opposite. Over if you look at the record for Ricky over the past few years, the tournaments he he's dominated and won, you know, when he won that five win season, it's typically in tournaments where he's not playing a full four four or five rounds, right? Um, coincidentally, that means majors, but it also means some of these events that Gannon has won, and, and Gannon right now is showing much. I think much like Isaac in terms of game plan that he is the most consistent player and if you stretch out over more than 3 rounds he is going to be at the top and you know in in a world where ganon I, well i would say you know ganon starts off slow with a 6 under uh, to open and isaac's a 10 and you're like wow okay you know world champion is just going to pick it up right where he left off a and and then all of a sudden ganon comes out and shoots the 10 and Isaac flip flops with him, shoots around that you know, a little lackluster, you know, considering it's half of what it was on on Thursday, and then backs it up with an eleven and shoots, you know, what I think is the hot round of the entire tournament with that eleven down, and sets himself up excellent going into this final round. That you're right, he plays a little slow, but there were clearly times that he chose not to run things that he absolutely could have. Well, sure. Sixteen being 100%. a key example, right? One hundred percent. It. He, he didn't uh, he have to, to have his foot with. on the gas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And did it get closer than he probably should have let it? Probably. But, you know, I think he demonstrates why he's so good over those four round tournaments. And, and Ricky is kind of one of the, one of the, you know, once again, had a spectacular final round, really good final round, but came up short. And there were opportunities missed by Ricky. I, I the 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 Gannon stuff is is kind of crazy. I mean, he swept the Pro Tour Plus events. Yes, he swept them. Right earlier this season, we were talking about how Gannon had won every four round tournament besides Champions Cup. Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe that's technically still true because <laughs> Worlds was a five round tournament. But regardless, like set the stuff aside, right? The majors, but. You know, Gannon has the one major, mm -hmm. and now he's swept the the Pro Tour Plus events, which is most money, the most prestige, four rounds. You know, theoretically the best courses. Although I don't, that's <laughs> not true, right? Like, yeah, that's just not true. Austin, come on. Um, <laughs> or no, it's Waco this year. It's Austin Waco. next year. Yeah, Waco, come on, Lake Waco, come on. <laughs> um, and along with the, with that this weekend, Gannon sets the new all-time record for most cash earned in prize money in a season and we're not even we're not even uh, we're still a month away from USDGC. Uh, he's got to he be hit, the first one. He can hit one. 200k, Josh. Yes. He he's got to be the first one to do it without the Pro Tour Championship, right? I th think that's it, certainly it's in true. In the post-COVID era. It's always come down to the end at 
Yeah, yes. like in recent history. And the keeps and, the record keeps getting broken every season. Right. But that's not an inevitability at this point. I mean, purses have only been going up, you know, 3%, 3% on average uh-huh. probably this year. So so not only have purses not increased in the same extent, but but Ricky and Kristen, who are your other two record setters over pre- and Missy over previous years, all did it thanks to just enormous payouts from the Pro Tour Championship. To Kristen's credit, I think she might be the first one who set the money record without winning the Pro Tour Championship. Um, That's probably true. I, I think every other one in recent memory from COVID has, has done it by winning the Pro Tour Championship, Missy and Ricky. But, you know, Kristen does it with just a second place, which credit to her. I mean, that means she had an excellent season. But the fact that Gannon did it before both playoff events, another major... And the Pro Tour Championship, four events that pay out historically very well. Like, uh, man, tip of the cap to Gannon. Uh, that, that's just a testament to how good he's been this season. All right. I, I got some topics that I want to throw at you that I've been kind of thinking about. Okay. Um, and one of them is just, wh- where are we right now in MPO? We're going to talk about FPO separately. But in MPO, right... I think last year we talked a lot about it, it was the parody era. Uh-huh. And I was actually just looking back at the the winners from last year. And it was really, it really felt that way, right? There was nobody that had more than I think three wins. And you had a lot of names up there from like legends like Matty O to guys like Adam Hammes to the big stalwart names like Waisaki and Macbeth and the upcoming, you know, strong players like Gannon and Isaac and so, like, all these people are winning all the time. And now, this season, it just doesn't feel that way anymore. Like, yes, there are still guys getting wins who maybe have never won before. In the case of, like, a Nicholas Antela or a Andrew Presnell. But predominantly, the strongest players have dominated again. Now, maybe that list of names is a little bit longer. But I wanted to give you this stat and just and get your thoughts on it. Okay. I was kind of thinking to myself about how it's very clear to me that the the era has changed. And I think what what when we talked about oh we're in the parody era now was a myth. I think what we were seeing was the changeover in eras with the passing of the torch going from the guys who were in their late 20s early 30s who have dominated the sport for the last decade, getting ready to pass the torch to Gannon and Isaac and AB. And those guys just weren't quite ready to be the next standard bearers. They won. I mean, AB didn't, Mm -hmm. but obviously Isaac and Gannon got wins last year. But now look what we're seeing, right? This season, okay, so last year, the combination of Ricky, Macbeth, Simon Lazat, Calvin Heimberg, they won a combined seven events last season. Okay. Okay. Gannon, Isaac. Which, uh, to to go, be re- fair, as opposed to previous Ricky and, like, you know, the, the, the Stalwarts era, way down, right? Ricky did way five, down. what, three years ago by himself. Right. So way, right. way, way, way down. Yeah. yeah okay. I'm okay, not, great. I'm not saying that last year was still the, like, you know, whatever. I, I think it was a year of a lot of parody. Yes. But, so and and then the, my 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 new kids category, which is Gannon, Isaac, AB, and Nicholas, mm-hmm. they won a combined five events last year. Okay, with two of those guys not winning at all, right? Right, right. Now fast forward to here, we're not even through the whole season. The old guard has six wins, About on largely track thanks to Ricky thing. and 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 Calvin. Yep. Uh, Macbeth has no wins. Lazad has one. And Gannon, Isaac, A.B., and, and Nicholas have 13. So what I ask you is to reflect on that fact and where we are right now in MPO. Uh, I, I think it's an excellent analysis about the parody era might have just been a parody year. And is is you know now changing over to what we, we traditionally see where talent gets consolidated at the top. Uh, I, I I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I I agree with it. The other point that I think I would make 
to kind of establish why last year parody felt like the name of the game and why that isn't the case this year is that you really have three ways that you can establish that you had a really good season and two of them are sufficient to give you a an excellent season three gives you rockstar season number one is majors you win multiple majors one major good but winning multiple majors obviously i mean that that really establishes you as a top dog number two consistency week in and week out where you are always in the conversation you're always in the mix you're always a threat uh, regardless of where it's at what tournament the importance you you're just there every single weekend and the number three is just wins and last season it didn't really feel like any player could do two or three of those things they can only do one isaac wins a pair of majors but the rest of the season you don't really see isaac he didn't get any other wins it's all he did and and so you know Isaac was it just got the majors, and Calvin was incredibly consistent and always at the top and and per, you know gave one of the most consistent seasons he's ever seen, but he only got two wins, including no majors, and so couldn't close out in either of the other two categories. Gannon had a couple wins, but he also remember last year had almost A B esque swings where he was he had a couple finishes outside the top fifty, uh, and didn't win any majors last season, and, and so. All your guys who are making cases to be at the top weren't able to do all uh, multiple of those accolades. And that is different this year. Because you have Gannon Burr, who is the most consistent player on tour, who has the most wins and is on track to put together wins that we have not seen post-COVID. He's got the major to boot, and he's putting together a complete resume. Uh, Ricky is playing incredibly consistent and has wins to boot. Isaac Robinson has a pair, has another major again, uh, and you know we'll see how he closes out the rest of the season. But it it just feels Anthony Barella has four wins, right? He's excelling in that category. It, it, it feels like now you have a couple standard bearers who are, like you said, really rising to the top, and it, it's I think that as players like Ricky and Paul and Simon continue to decline because you know father a father time is uh is undefeated then you're going to not it's going to feel less and less like parody and more and more like oh yeah this new generation really does only have four guys maybe five uh who who are going to excel and again that that list is longer and every generation of top talent that list is going to continue to grow because you know, welcome, welcome to professional sports so that people are taking an interest earlier and and the games developing maybe. and maybe maybe I don't know if I agree. I'll tell you why. Okay, okay, please. Let's look at a sport that's been around forever. I I think Tennis. I know exactly. What's, yeah, I there it is. Yep, yep. And like, yeah, sure. You know, you have plenty of guys who are really good, and the overall level is going up over time. But you also still have one or two or maybe three players who just kill everybody else most sure. of the time. They're just yeah. the best. No. Good point. And like the history of disc golf has been the same. Now obviously the history of disc golf is much shorter. And you know, I think you can look at golf as a sport where there are times where there's not a clear consensus number 1 absolutely dominating, but right now we're in it. Yeah. Scheffler is is unbelievable. Yep. And of course, we had, you know, like 20 years of Tiger. Um, and I just think that there are often going to be players who are just that little bit better. Uh, and we may not get a wide group of players who are all kind of at the same level and trading wins week in and week out. Um, I, I don't know. Like, I think you could still make a case for like parody being a part of the story of this season, but it doesn't really feel like it. It feels yeah. more like Gannon letting him get away sometimes than it does like he's just one in the pack. Okay. Um, by the way, you mentioned Father Time. I posted in the Discord this over the weekend that I'm ready to have the conversation. And I've avoided this topic and I've actually poo-pooed it many times over the last few years. Macbeth 
is done. He's cooked. He's washed. I'm worried he might not ever win one again. He'll probably win one. He'll probably win probably one. Win one. He'll, he'll pull a just, Tigers Masters. Here we are in a year and he hasn't won one. And I'm looking at the calendar and I'm thinking to myself, where is he getting it? Mm-hmm. And has he has he proven many wrong before? Could he prove me wrong? Sure. But I think that the – and when I say washed, I'm being unnecessarily harsh because he's still a very good player. He's still going to finish top 10, top 5, maybe a few times a year. He's yep. a tremendous talent. But I just don't think he's got it all at this point. He, do, he just doesn't have it all anymore. And I think it's hard to come to terms with that, I, I, certainly for him. But even right. us as fans, you still kind of think that he's going to f- figure it out. But it's like now it's been like three years of him not really figuring it out. And the way that this season has gone, I'm like, it's it's done deal. Hmm. Uh, well, and, you know, the the other thing is like you, you gave him credit because he's been injured a couple times. Uh, you gave him credit because... Uh, kid gave him credit because of you know and 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 it just feels like they're feels like the excuses are out and uh and it's it's nothing to be ashamed of no uh his instagram post uh you know i i i I didn't think about it in this context at the time but uh did he post for deglow he did post for deglow and i haven't seen it it, i'm looking forward to hearing about what it, it said (laughs) <laughs> Digo didn't go as planned, but I worked on some much needed holes in my game. Time to carry these lessons into the final four events. And uh listen, if Paul's not making excuses on Instagram about why he didn't win, that 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 signals a shift in, you know, maybe he maybe he didn't think he deserved to win. Maybe he didn't think that he's going to win. I don't know. It's different. It's different. <laughs> Uh, Macbeth can't win. He makes excuses on Instagram and we roast him and he doesn't. And we say, oh, might as well hang up the bag, Paul. <laughs> uh, but it's just, it's, it's, not, I don't even want him to hang it up. I mean, like, no. But some of these guys who we've been watching for years, they, they just, they just don't quite have it anymore. And the young kids, they, they throw further. They have more well rounded games. Um, they excel in areas like Macbeth always was like top five and everything. And that's kind of where Gannon is right now. And Macbeth, he seems to always have one or two things that are just not clicking in his game right now. And with the way that he plays, he has to have it all working in order to have a chance to win. Yeah. He can't get away with just being a bomber or, you know, being an electric circle two putter or whatever. So I, I just I, I don't know why, but for some th- for some reason this weekend with Gannon winning and Macbeth not playing very well, I was like, it just hit me. I was like, I just don't think he can do it now. And it, it, it makes sense. He's getting older, he's got a lot of priorities, he's got a kid. He's already showed signs of decline over the last two years. And I think mm-hmm. I've been holding off to giving him credit for what he's been able to do in the past because he did win that worlds in a year where he didn't play particularly yeah. well. Yep. Um, yeah. And, and he, you know, I, I won't be shocked if he wins another one, but I also won't be shocked if he doesn't. All right. It, it It's crazy to think that odds may be in the favor. Like if you were to have to take odds right now of Paige and Paul not winning another tournament, like, those odds are better than ever now. It's true. It's true. Oh, what's the over under on Paul and Page uh, victories moving from this point forward in their careers? Combined over under one and a half. I probably take the over just because of Champions Cup next year. Because Page OTB. Uh huh. Uh huh. Because like. I count on that, and then I count on Paul to like win a USDGC and have his his Masters moment when he comes back. And it's gonna be so sick if he does that. 
<laughs> that's that's I probably take I think two. I think two is the number two I probably half? take the bet. What about on? two and a half? Under. Under. All right. We'll let, the, we'll let the people in the chat let us know what they think. Um we're gonna take a break. When we come back, I have some thoughts on on Kristen and the challenger committee and FPO. And I also want to take a snapshot look at player of the year conversation before we head into the playoffs. No tournament this weekend, so got some time to get you ready for the playoffs next week. The Upshot is presented by Pound Disc Golf, makers of the best bags in the sport. Got some great new info for you. They just dropped Valerie Mondahano and Mason Ford Ambassador Packs. They're both double convertible Rufus bags. The Rufus is what I carry. Absolutely love it. You got to get one. Um, and they have also the custom program available for the new shoulder bag, the Vagabond. Stock Vagabonds are already sold out, but more are coming. And you can already go get yourself a brand new custom one if that's what you're into. So, um, you know, a great option for a smaller size pack or uh, something you keep in your car. And check out another drop of stock Vagabond colorways coming up in the next week or so. Uh, more ambassador packs on the way as well. So check everything out on Pound Disc Golf social media or at pounddiscgolf.com. Welcome back to the Upshot. All right, Josh. We got to talk about Kristen. Okay. And we got to talk about the Challenger Committee. And so here, here is my my thoughts right now. And then I want to get your take, just like before. There is now just one committee. Kristen is a part of the committee. There is no dominant favorite in FPO anymore. And while I think that Kristen could retake the clear number one spot, I think that the trajectory of this season and some missed opportunities from Kristen in spots where over the last two years she has proven to be almost unbeatable shows me that she's no longer at this time that having that that killer instinct level that lets her just surpass people over and over and I'm not saying that she needs to win every tournament but it's about the overall level of play the number of bad rounds, the level of focus, the average performance on the weekends that hasn't been there for Kristen for many months. Really since she got, since she left the U.S. before coming back to play European Open. And while we obviously have seen Kristen play at an extremely high level, even earlier this season, there's only one committee right now and I'll give you the, I'll give you the stats in a second, but I just want to get your thoughts on that first. Am I, am I overreacting? No, I, I don't think you're overreacting. Yeah, you know, she may still come into tournaments as odds on favorite, but it, it she just pairs and, and, and this, you know, when we went into the final round, uh, Kristen was one stroke behind Holland. I'm like, okay, this is it. If Kristen <laughs> wants to quiet the haters. If she wants to come out and show us, you know, so round round one, she's six down. She's three strokes behind own. And I go, oh, boy. OK. And then round two, she comes out. She was hot round. Uh, no, sorry, t- sorry. Cat murder shot, thought round shot the eight down slides herself into second. And you go, OK. All right. Here it is. And Holland shoots crazy round. But Kristen's still only one stroke back. And you're like, mm, not great. But but she needed to win that she needed to win this weekend to, to quiet that doubt and, and she didn't she didn't close out and not only did she didn't close out she had another final round that was spectacularly bad and Kristen still could win win out this season no no, no doubt about my her capacity to do that uh but last season was a wake up call and the rest of the FPO division uh picked up. And they are elevating their game. And Kristen's regression means that in past seasons, 
and this is this is a little bit of credit to Kristen that the level that she played at was so high that even when she had regressions, the field was so far behind her that it didn't matter. Uh, Holland was in no shape to win last season. Evelina could not putt anything. Missy was your only contender. Uh, you know, Owen had a couple of, of solid performances, but you know, never. She just doesn't have the capacity to shoot the kind of rounds necessary uh, in every single situation. And, and so, regardless of what it was, Kristen's regressions weren't as impactful. And this season, they are, and that's that's the difference. You want to create some crazy stats? Here's one for you. Yeah, Let's Kristen's see. at her lowest rating in over a year. She's 995 rated. That's the lowest since the August 2023 update when she was 994. That's number one. Number two, Kristen has not averaged, and obviously this is correlated, has not yeah. averaged over a thousand at an event since April. Wow. She won the European Open averaging 985 when Silva and Evelina imploded and should have beaten her. Um, of course, she hasn't won since the European Open. Uh, she did not play very well at Worlds by her standards. Mm -hmm. She still averaged, she still finished on the podium. She still averaged 990. I don't want to overstate right. the situation here. She's still clearly one of the best players and probably the favorite going into most events. Although, I don't necessarily know that she's going to be the guaranteed odds on money favorite at this point going into these late events this season. Like it's, you're gonna have to think about it. Sure. Sure. But she's still the highest rated player in the world. Mm -hmm. It's just that now the level of play that she's bringing week to week over now, what is a many month stretch is not especially higher than what we're seeing from champion level performances from the other strong players in the FPO field. Now, obviously, that, that list is not long. There's only probably four or five players that are really in the conversation, uh, but that's that's typical of FPO. And if you look at the stats, I think, you know, Kristen still has the most wins with five, hmm. but there's a level of convincingness that hasn't been there in her game for quite some time. Yes. Uh, let me give you one other comparison. When Kristen was at the thousand rated mark, Owen was our second highest player, player, and I believe she was at nine eighty five. Um, yeah. Uh, see, uh, so uh, right now you have three players who are rated at nine eighty seven: Owen, Holland, who jumped two points, and Evelina, who jumped six. And then you have two more players in the 980 mark, which is Haley and Missy. And so the gap between Kristen and other players by rating, again, correlated, of course, but the gap between Kristen and other players on rating is, is smaller than it's been in a long time. Yeah, eight points. 100%. Eight points separates them. Yeah. Now, I wonder if we'll feel differently if... You know, Kristen wins one of the next two playoff events, wins throw pink, wins the tour championship. Do we all come in here and eat crow? Probably. <laughs> probably. I think if she did that, she'd probably win player of the year. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I think if she's Depends a couple a little wins bit on above. what Evelina does. Right, it, that's the thing. You need Evelyn not to win. You need Kristen probably at seven wins, with one of those being a pseudo major, i.e., either disc golf pro tour championship or uh, <laughs> uh, throw pink. I thought throw pink was a major. Uh, you know, it, it pseudo depends. major. It depends. On, it depends on the day. <laughs> what was the What was the DGN thing? It was like major like or something like that. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> major esque. Um. <laughs> So let's let's take a quick snapshot of player of the year. Okay. Kristen has five wins. It's the most. She's got one major. Evelyn's got four wins with two of those being majors. Missy's got four wins with one major. 
And then you've got Holland with three wins, Owen with two wins, Silva with two wins. Um, I think it's fairly obvious that it's Kristen or Evelina right now. Who do you take? Uh, Evelina. Yeah. Uh, definitely Evelina. Um, we and this comes back uh, on this pod we value majors and we've always valued majors and we consistently value majors like if anything you can argue we value majors too a little bit too much and to our detriment at times uh but that's just how we feel we you know and, and i maybe i'm speaking too much for you here charlie but uh that that's how i feel still and one win by Kristen is not enough to overcome the two major credit that Evelina gets in her wins and you know Kristen is going to have to do some work but Evelina is the favorite for player of the year right now gotta be the favorite um what is she playing next that's one thing I've been wondering about I think she was planning on being back for GMC let's see if she's still registered she is okay so let's assume that she's playing given the weak gap makes a lot of sense why she should be able to make it back for that right you know, she 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 basically got a month off because of the scheduling after Worlds by just missing D. So yeah, I mean, I I think I think I agree. I think Kristen still has a great shot to win it, even if people are going to be feeling kind of reluctant to give it to her because of this long. Let's be honest, we can call it a slump. That's mm-hmm. probably deserves to be called a slump by her standards. Um, but you know, still has a great chance to to if she can pick up. Probably at, probably needs two more wins, and then she, it becomes a tough conversation. Agreed, right? Because if she dominates the beginning of the season and then she dominates the end of the season and she has a major win, even if it felt like a little lackluster of a win, let's not forget that Evelina was the one who really choked that away, and Chris right. played great in the final round. Right, right, exactly. So, um, yeah, and it's, and it's, you're it's willing an interesting. You're willing to forgive some of that time off that. That sure. Kristen had right, but if, well, because if remember, she's Kristen still... got hurt, right? She like yes. broke her rib. Uh huh. You know, there's a lot of reasons. What here's what's really weird about wedding. it to me, right? The the wedding, of course, the <laughs> wedding. The thing that's weird about it to me is that when right before Worlds, she was playing amazing in practice rounds. Uh-huh. She sounded incredibly confident, and then proceeded to like kind of stink for like three of the rounds. Very strange. It is strange. Very strange. It, it almost feels like a mental thing. There it is, folks. Um, yeah, it's the span. I don't know. Five five thirty is an early time to get up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, it's this good. Yeah, last, you're up late. This I is mean, the last one. This is the last one. No. Um, MPO. I think the answer is fairly obvious, but let's go through the exercise. Gannon <laughs> six wins with a major. Barella four wins. Waisaki three wins. Heimberg and Antela with two wins. Then you got Isaac Robinson and Andrew Presnell, who only have one win, but they're both majors. So okay. question is, can anybody even catch Gannon? And who and how? Uh, I uh, Barello Isaki can win out and they catch Gannon. That's it. That That's the list, I think. Um, you don't think Heimberg would, can win out? Because winning out means you win GMC, MVP, uh, USDGC, Pro Tour Championship. Yeah, no, no. Because then he's tied with Gannon. Heim- Heimberg would win, right? No, I, no, I, no, no. I, if Heimberg sweeps these last four, sure. He would have six no wins. No way. He yeah, would have six wins, including a major. Right. But, but Burr did it at all of the four round events over the season and was more consistent than Calvin. So they have the same stats, they have the same wins, same majors, but Burr has more money and was more consistent all season than Calvin I was. I think Calvin might end up with more money if he swept. Depends on where Gann finishes. But let's but, let you make it sound like it's obviously still Gannon when if that happened, it would be like no, he would definitely no. want to vote for Calvin. No, no. No, I think you're crazy. You think I'm I, crazy? I think you're crazy. I I think anybody here, I'm gonna say this. Anybody who gave Calvin credit for his consistency last season cannot vote for Calvin this season. 
even if he sweeps out. It is an unacceptable vote if you vote for Calvin this season sweeping the or ending out and closing out the season because if you voted for Calvin last season because Gannon has done what Calvin did well, just a little bit light, right? Like it, you had you have Calvin light consistency this season from Gannon and then they would be tight in wins. There's no way you can justify giving it to Ca- Calvin to Calvin over Gannon even with a sweep out. <laughs> Calvin's well, what got a, about winning Calvin, the most important events of the season at the end of the year. He Calvin Gannon won all the elite plus events. How can you say that Gannon won, or Calvin won the, all the the most important events over and significantly differentiated himself from Gannon? Well, I, I'm not the one who made up the stupid DGPT rules. Me neither, but playoffs. I'm going to follow it. Who? <laughs> What's the difference? Would you rather this- win in the regular season or win in the playoffs, Josh? <laughs> I would rather these not be given the same weight as playoffs. To be fair, Elite you wouldn't know anything about that as a Broncos fan anyway, so don't worry about uh, it. <laughs> that was that was unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I don't know what Sean Payton was doing when he thought Bo Nix should throw it 42 times in his rookie opener. I can't believe uh, <laughs> that's uh, true. I can't <laughs> believe we haven't talked about the NFL yet. I like fans were hoping they are European listeners, especially were like, oh, my gosh, maybe maybe this season's different. It's not. folks. It's, <laughs> it's not. not uh, let me let me give you some important numbers here, Charlie, real quick. Gannon has uh, Gannon has not finished outside the top 10 this season. His drops from the disc golf pro tour standings. Include. Seventh place, seventh place, tenth place, thirteenth. Sorry, thirteenth place. OTB. My apologies. There was a thirteenth in there. Fifth place, seventh place, tenth place, eighth place. That's what Gannon's dropped. You ready for what Calvin's dropped? Thirty fourth. Yeah, thirty fourth. Stinkers. I know. Forty fourth, seventh, twenty third, nineteenth. If you voted for Calvin last year, you cannot not vote for Gannon this season. Uh, over Calvin, uh, vote for Calvin over Gannon. It's not possible. The metric that we set. To give it to Calvin last year gives it to Gannon this year. No question about that. Uh, that that would be a Missy. That would be like Missy getting the the nod it would because she closed be out like and that. our recency bias. It would same not thing. be like that. Same thing. You are you are making up <laughs> lies and slander same against thing. this ridiculous hypothetical. Uh, uh, no, it would not why, because so- Missy Missy <laughs> legit just wasn't even close to Paige's season. She just wasn't. But if they literally had the same number of wins and major <laughs> wins, like it would be clearly a discussion that we would have to have. And I think that I agree with your logic as it's laid out right now. But Thank you. Uh, I don't, I, I, it might be hard not to vote for Calvin if he absolutely goes monster at the end of the, the season. Re, the anyway, recency the bias, The point though. is, I probably anyway. agree, it's probably <laughs> would have to be Barella or Waisaki. Uh, and I think I think both of those guys would need to win USDGC as one of them. Oh, have to, have to. If they don't win, if Burrell and Waisaki don't win USDGC, this season's a wrap. Like, just yeah. GG go it's, next. It's been, give it's the been award quite the year. It it's has been quite the year for Gannon. I think I think he's he's probably like an eighty five percent favorite to win Player of the Year right now. If, if Gannon wins USDGC, like this is going to be, this is going to be the, a historic the, season. It would be. It would be the best. It would be the best season since COVID, no doubt. Um. It, it, it and it would probably stand for quite a while as one of the best seasons, unless he himself beats it again. It's it's remarkable what he has done. He's just he's relentless. He's absolutely yeah. relentless. He he's got all three. It's, he's got, it's, he's got it makes three. it. It's what makes it strange is that it's like he didn't win worlds. I know, but no. I think but, it, it goes to show that, like, to some extent, still, there's like a coarse bias hmm. that plays in Gannon's favor a lot of the time. But he doesn't even like Toboggan. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, honestly, like, Gannon, Gannon is. Uh, uh, and, and here's the thing if I asked you. Who's the favorite to win USDGC right now? Got it's obviously Gannon. Gannon. It's obviously Gannon. And, and if I gave you the over under 0.5 events that Gannon wins to close out the season, take the over, over right? Yeah. I, I mean, talk Even about... one and a half, I have to think about it. Right, right. 
Because you've got two four rounders coming up. Like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> watch out. Oh, three. What was it? Four actually. Technically, with with the Pro Tour Championship, the rest of our tournaments yeah, to close of the season are four They're rounders. Four rounders. Mm-hmm. I I hope the rest of the field are shaking in their boots because Gannon is about to come in, and, and I like. There's a good chance that you know we're talking about Calvin sweeping or you know Ricky needing to sweep uh, in order to make this conversation interesting. Those things are not uh, happening, obviously. Uh, no, I, and and honestly, Gannon could come out and sweep, and I would not be I would not be shocked. It'd be remarkable. It'd be an, it, it. It would close out uh, one of uh, you know an all time great seasons uh, for sure. But uh, I would not be shocked even a little bit. Well, it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun um, to figure out what else is going on. Uh, just one show this week, folks. I'm starting my transit back to the United States. Uh, I get back Friday. We'll be back on a normal schedule next week. We'll get you ready for the Pro Tour uh, playoffs. We'll take a look at the current standings, break down how all the you know the cut lines work as we go forward here. Um, we'll also probably take some more mail. So if you have thoughts, you can hit us up at upshot@ultiworld.com. Apologies for some of the choppiness of shows over the last month or so, but combination of travel and work and time zones and everything has made it a little tough for us to get our normal kind of standard two a week in but we will be rocking and rolling um i'll be at usdgc and throw pink i'm on the call for throw pink so i'm nice. uh looking forward to doing i think we'll do daily rapid reacts again for yep. the uh the major and the major like event that happens there <laughs> in rock hill <laughs> and uh, we've got a very exciting final, you know, five or six weeks of the season coming up. So it's hard to believe it's almost over. And there's, you know, it feels like things feel pretty settled in the in the player of the year race in MPO, but it's certainly still wide open in FPO. So I'm, I'm excited to see what happens. Uh, Josh, your favorite tournament of the year is coming up. How are you feeling? Uh, it is. I'm thrilled. I love GMC. Uh, they're just... I'm excited to see the the combo of Portland and Beaver State for the Northwest Challenge. I think that's what it's called for next season. Uh, th- that's going to put up a good rivalry, I think. But my gosh, these courses, they're beautiful. They are exciting to watch. They challenge a complete skill set. They're beautiful. Did I mention that? Uh, Vermont in late <laughs> summer. Like, gosh, I-, I-, I love watching these events. I think they're so much fun. And historically, GMC does give us some different winners. Uh, it, 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 the, I think, especially Brewster Ridge, gives rise to some players, thanks to the Woods, that are not the ones who win every single week always. And so I think we should have your, you know, your, your Burr for sure, your Rikesaki for sure. Uh, but you know, you might also have a couple of players that surprise us up at the top. So always an exciting one to watch. All right. Well, that is going to do it for this edition of The Upshot. Thank you so much for tuning in. For Josh Mansfield, I'm Charlie Eisenhood saying so long, and we will talk to you next week right here on The Upshot.